you shall get. So even the one who wants agriculture and he has to plant and whatnot, Allah will say, go ahead and plant. And he will plant. And the majority of people are not interested in doing that, but he will be given the opportunity to do uh, that. So in the end, realize that Jannah is the place that every person shall have their desires fulfilled. But of course, as long as those desires are within the purview of that which is permissible and that which is you know, understandable and reasonable and logical. There are certain desires that are simply unnatural. And in the ne next life, even if they exist in this world, in the next life, there simply are not going to be present in the individual. So even if a person was struggling with certain desires in this world, and they're wanting, you know, fulfillment, but they're controlling themselves, they shall be rewarded. Uh, and in the next life, those desires are not going to exist for them, and they shall attain happiness, and they shall attain bliss in the normal desires given to all of uh, mankind. Now, there's one other issue that has raised some controversy of desires of Jannah. And that is, what if somebody desires a child? What if somebody wants a baby? What if somebody wants to basically start a family? Because see, it's one thing to say that you want a library, you get all these books. It's one thing to say you want, um, you know, ca camels and horses or whatnot and that, okay, you can understand that. But you see, another human being raises a whole bunch of philosophical and theological questions, right? Is that, are you going to procreate to the, the in the manner of actually having children? I mean, as for intimacy, we will talk about that. Of course, there is the pleasure of intimacy and the pleasure of companionship, but does that mean there's going to be children? And those children are then going to be nurtured and grow up? What if somebody wants to have a child in Jannah? In fact, our scholars have discussed this uh, in some detail. Ibn al-Qayyim uh, in his famous book that I'm, most of my lectures are based upon, uh, this series is based upon um, his book, uh, that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions a number of uh, uh, issues in this regard. And he says that some ulama have said that if a person desires to have a child in Jannah, that Allah shall fulfill that desire. And they base this on a hadith in Tirmidhi that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Mu'minu, idha ishtaha al-waladu fil jannati kana hamluhu wa wad'uhu wa sinnuhu fi sa'a kama yashtahi. That if a person desires a child in Jannah, then the pregnancy and the delivery and the uh, weaning of the child will take place instantaneously. As all of that's going to basically happen instantaneously as he desires, as he uh, you know uh, wants uh, wants it to be. And uh, the uh, this hadith has been graded authentic by a number of scholars, including uh, Al Albani. And so, based upon this hadith, the hadith clearly says the mu'min if he desires a child in Jannah. So the entire pregnancy and the entire delivery and basically the growing up the, of the child will take place basically in an instant. So all of this, all of the, the, the difficult stuff is going to happen you know, very quickly. Is it going to happen instantaneously? And then the child will be there, you know, for him to play with or to nurture to whatever, you know, whatever, you know, he wants to start a family. However, other scholars said that in Jannah, the intimacy that will take place will not result in a child. And this is the position of Tawus and Mujahid and Ibrahim and Nakha'i and others. And Imam al-Bukhari says that it has been narrated from Abu Rizin al-Uqayli that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that the people of Jannah shall not have any children. And this hadith is reported in Imam Ahmad, even though Bukhari makes a reference to it, but it is reported uh, uh, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that righteous men and righteous women, they will be in Jannah and they will have each other's the pleasures of intimacy as they have in this world, except that they will not have children. So believing men and women will enter into Jannah and they shall be together and they shall be intimate. Husbands and wives will be intimate in Jannah. But the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, there is no giving birth in Jannah. And so this hadith seems to indicate there is no giving birth. And another hadith says when a mu'min desires a child, then he shall get one. So what, uh, and Ibn al-Qayyim says this hadith seems to be uh, authentic. However, uh, you know, Shaykh al-Bani considered it to be uh, not authentic. So again, this uh, the controversy over which hadith uh, is, is taking precedence uh, over another. And uh, Ibn al-Qayyim mentions, Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that some of the previous scholars said 
that the phrasing of the first hadith indicates what is intended. If a believer desires to have a child, then Allah will give such and such, meaning hypothetically, theoretically, if somebody desired it, they would be given it, but Allah would never allow them, Allah would never have that emptiness in them that they wanted. So the point of the hadith is that there's a perfection being said, that if somebody desired even a child, then they would even get that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them so happy with what they have that they shall never desire a child. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim himself concluded, that there are not going to be children born in Jannah. And he mentions a number of evidences for this. First and foremost, he said, the hadith of Abu Rizin, uh, which is in the Mustad Ibn Ahmad, that the Prophet sallallahu said that uh, the believing men and women will be together in Jannah and they will enjoy each other in Jannah, but they shall not have children. So this hadith, he said, is obviously the most explicit evidence. Number two, that Allah says in the Quran, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ That they are going to have pure spouses and pure wives in Jannah. مُطَهَّرَةٌ And مُطَهَّرَةٌ means that they shall never ever have any menstruation or any bleeding. So if they are without any menses, then how are they going to be having children? So point no, evidence number two that Allah describes the spouses as being mutahhar, mutahhara. And mutahhara means they're not gonna have the cycle or their periods. Evidence number uh, three is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will uh, uh, also mentions that uh, the notion of giving birth and, and having these, uh, these, you know, the fluids that comes out, it comes under mutahara as well. So Ibn Qayyim says that it's not just the issue of the hayb, but also the male fluid as well, and also the excrements that happen, you know, during the time of, of delivery. Uh, all of this, uh, it doesn't make sense for the people of Jannah to have. Point number four, he says that it is authentically narrated uh, in the uh, hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and we're gonna come to this hadith by the way in another lecture, so I'm just gonna mention it briefly, we're gonna come back to this, that uh, once everybody has entered Jannah, there shall be an empty space left, or there shall be a surplus of spots in Jannah. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shall create a new creation and cause them to enter Jannah so that Jannah becomes fully occupied. Now this hadith is very interesting. It raises a number of interesting questions. We shall come back to this hadith in a future lecture inshallah ta'ala. Right now, this hadith is saying that when everybody finishes entering Jannah, everything is now over, all the last person of Jahannam has finally entered, there's still gonna be empty plots, empty spots. What's gonna happen to that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a new creation. And that creation will be asked to enter and they shall fill up those empty spots so there's not gonna be any spots left. Okay, what has this got to do with our topic of children in Jannah? Response, clearly, if children were being born and raised and, and you know, uh, coming to adulthood, so then the spots would have to be unlimited because many families would have children and those children would grow up and even if they did not have other children, but if you have an eternity of people and every few millennia or however long you wanted to have children, so then obviously the plots of Jannah would have to be continued to be increased. But this hadith is saying that a time will come when there's only a few spots left and Allah will create a new creation and they will take over the remaining spots of Jannah. And so this shows, according to Ibn al-Qayyim, that there will not be a perpetually new creation that will require other spots in uh, Jannah. Point number five, Ibn al-Qayyim says, and again, by the way, subhanAllah, I have to say here that some might say that this topic is somewhat frivolous, that you know, we, have, we should just get into Jannah. And you know what, at some level, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Let's worry about getting into Jannah and we're gonna be happy when we're there. However, at the same time, this issue of having children in Jannah is not as important uh, as a response as it is in methodology. Just look here at Ibn al-Qayyim's brilliant mind that I guarantee you that if you were to ask you know, out of a hundred or out of a thousand scholars, if you're to ask 999 who haven't read these treatises and whatnot to figure out this question, that they would be stumped. They wouldn't know what to do. 
The fact that Ibn al-Qayyim, you know, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, is basically scouring encyclopedic mind, he's scouring these sources and extracting benefits from verses and a hadith that you don't really think about from that manner. This is where the benefit lies for us, is that look at the methodology and look at the, uh, the, the minds and how they're working, that they're extrapolating from these texts benefits that are not something that is apparent to the initial reader. And so this hadith of the space being filled up with a new creation and then Jannah is full, nobody would think, you know, when you first read it, that that also has an, a, a bearing or an impact on children being born in Jannah. But that's the mind of Ibn al-Qayyim. Uh, point number five that he mentions, point number five that he mentions that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Surah Tur, verse 21. Surah Tur, verse 21. And again, when you first read this, you would never think that this is something that is, that is relevant to uh, the children of Jannah. Allah says in the Quran, those who do good deeds and their children follow them in righteousness and good deeds. So the parents were good and they raised their children upon good. The parents have moved on, the children remained upon good. What does Allah say? Alhaqna bihim dhurriyatahum. We will cause their children to be reunited with them in Jannah. Okay? And the meaning here, and again, we'll talk about this point in, in, a, in, a, in another lecture, is that, and this is a beautiful point here, very beautiful point here, that the people of Jannah will be together with those whom they love. I mean, think about it, that you know, you are with those whom you love. So you love your parents, you love your children, you love your spouse, you love your, you know, you, you have this love of people. If you were to get to Jannah, may Allah make us amongst them, what are the possibilities, what are the statistical possibilities that your family, your spouse, your parents, your children are at the exact same level based upon their good deeds? That's not gonna, it's not, I mean, realistically, right? I mean, imagine, you know, husband and wife, imagine mother and father, you know, son and daughter, imagine that you want to be together as a family. How realistic is it that you scored the exact same and therefore you got into the exact same level? Clearly, one of you will be higher than the other. If, if we're all getting there, inshaAllah ta'ala, clearly there are gonna be different levels. Allah is saying, don't worry, I will keep families united. Alhaqna bihim dhurriyatahum. Their children shall be united with them. Now, how that happens, we'll talk about inshaAllah later on. And there's two ways of this happening. Uh, we'll talk about that later on inshaAllah ta'ala. We don't wanna to get to that point over here. But the point being, Ibn al-Qayyim says, and this is an interesting point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified that from his generosity, he would put the children of the righteous that were with them in this world, he shall put them with them in the hereafter. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to allow other children, he should have mentioned it in this verse as well, that he's going to allow the children of this world and add other children as well. And that would been, have been something that would bring a calmness to their eyes and a comfort to their soul, that whoever was righteous, we shall give you the family of this world and even more family in the next world. And of course, the point is that the Quran never mentions extra family when it comes to Jannah. The Quran never mentions that once you get to Jannah, the Quran mentions rivers, it mentions food, you know, it mentions, you know, so many uh, things. It does not mention that you're gonna have extra families extra children. And in fact, what it does mention, your children of this world, if they were righteous, shall be with you. And so there is an indirect indication that you're not gonna have extra progeny. And that's what Ibn al-Qayyim is deriving from this verse. So this is point number five. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim has seven points, beautiful. Point number six, and again, this is now a logical point here. Point number six is that if we allow children to be born in Jannah, then you have one of two possibilities. Either we allow this without any limit, which is infinity, or we allow it for some and not for others, and you allow a partial. And both of these do not make sense for Jannah. Because as for the uh, infinity, so then this means that, of course, as we said, Jannah is already gonna be pretty much full up and whatnot. So now we're gonna have people continuing more and more and more. And this will go on forever and ever and ever. That doesn't make any sense that you're gonna increase uh, the people of Jannah. And as for putting conditions on it, 
and allowing it for some or other and not others, or allowing it for one generation and not another, then this seems to be uh, a, a privilege or something that is going to put a stop to your happiness if it's allowed for some and not for others. And therefore, he says, it also does not make uh, any sense. And also, given the fact that there is no death in Jannah, so then how can uh, you know we allow for an infinity to keep on increasing the number of people in Jannah? Because there will never be any death in Jannah. So it's not as if one generation goes and another generation comes. Therefore, point number six, there is no logical uh, sense to this. And then he says point number seven, the final point that Ibn Qayyim mentions, is that uh, in Jannah, there is no growth of a person. People do not grow up. They don't become you know, different or change. Rather, we know that they remain at the same age of 33. They remain at that prime age of 33. And if a child is to be born, and it's going to then grow up, this is not a child of 33. It's not going to be the same age. And therefore, Ibn Qayyim concludes after these seven points, وَالْجَنَّةُ لَيْسَتْ دَارُ تَنَاسُلٍ بَلْ دَارُ بَقَاءٍ وَخُلْدٍ لَا يَمُوتُ مَنْ فِيهَا فَيَقُومُ نَسَلَهُ نَسْلُهُ مَقَامُهُ That Jannah is not the abode of procreation. It is the abode of remaining and eternity. No one shall die in Jannah so that there is going to be a replacement after him. There's no need for replacement, right? So the point being that, why are children needed? That is, the children are needed because we do not live forever. And so we need those to take our place. We need to basically ensure that our line, our lineage remains after us. But in Jannah, permanency. So there's no need for children. Therefore, Ibn Qayyim concludes that indeed there is no, uh, uh, there's not going to be any new children in Jannah. Now, after all of that is said, in the end of the day, of course, Ibn Qayyim points are very, very solid. In the end of the day, I do go back to what we had said that leave this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever desires anything that is permissible shall get it. If they desire this, then Allah will grant some way of doing this. And if Allah has willed, they will not desire this. So we should not uh, ponder too deeply about this point. I was more interested in the methodology of extraction rather than the uh, question itself. Okay, this leads us now to the actual point of today's lecture that I wanted to do, we'll just do this very briefly. Actually, I might come back to this point if time runs out, we'll come back to this point uh, in our next lecture. And uh, the what I wanted to do today was the well-known fact. In fact, we all know this, but very few of us know the evidences for it, right? So it's one thing to know, it's another thing to know how you know, okay? Everybody knows that Jannah is of levels. In Arabic, this is called Darajat. Everybody knows this. And it is something that is ingrained in our psyche and conscience. Okay, what is the evidence for this? How do we know there are levels of Jannah? The response, there are many verses in the Quran and many a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that indicate that Jannah has levels. And in our previous series when I did Jahannam, we talked about the levels of Jahannam. Now the word in Arabic is interesting that in Arabic, uh, unlike English, Levels that go up are called one thing and levels that go down are called another thing, okay? In our English vernacular, we simply say, you know, the levels or the degrees. And it doesn't matter whether they're going up or down. You have degrees of separation, you have levels, you know, you have footsteps, it's all the same. In Arabic, when it's going upwards, it's called darajat. And when it's going downwards, it's called darakat with a kaf. Darajat for up and darakat for down. Jannah has darajat. And we talked about in our last lectures, Jahannam has darakat. Jahannam has darak with the kaf, and Jannah has darajat with the jim. And there are many evidences for this of them. Very briefly, you can write these down. Surah An-Nisa, verse 95 and 96, that Allah Azza wa has preferred those who strive in His way over those who sit down uh, with a great reward. Darajatim minhu wa maghfira. Many levels from Him. Okay, and forgiveness. And Surah Al-Anfal, verse 4, Allah describes the believers as those who, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts tremble. And uh, when the Quran is recited, their iman uh, goes up and they have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Lahum darajatun inda rabbihim. Those groups of people, they have darajat, they have the highest levels with their Lord. In Surah Ali Imran, verse 163, 
Allah describes once again another group of believers, هُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ Allah. Those people will have the higher levels with Allah. The very fact that Allah says higher levels. Surah Taha, verse 75. وَمَنْ يَأْتِهِ مُؤْمِنًا قَدْ عَمِلَ الصَّالِحَاتِ فَأُولَيْكَ لَهُمُ الدَّرَجَاتُ الْعُلَى Whoever comes to Allah as a believer, having done good deeds, that person shall have Darajatul Ula, the highest level. So here we have again highest levels, the double emphasis. Darajat means levels. Ula, the highest of uh, levels. Surah Al Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that uh, there's a higher level. Then Allah says, That lower than this, there are also two Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly mentions that there's higher levels and that there are lower levels as well. And of course, this is something that is explicitly mentioned uh, in a number of hadith. Abu Sa'id al Khudri uh, mentions in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that in Jannah, uh, the people that are in the highest uh, chambers, the people that are in the highest chambers, they are called the Ahlul Ghuraf, uh, that uh, you shall see them or the people shall see them like a star is seen in the sky that flickers on and off, the farthest of scars, stars in the eastern or western skies, that the people of Jannah will look up to the people of the Ghuraf. Now pause here, what is the Ghuraf? We will talk about this ghuraf as well in a, another lecture, inshallah ta'ala, maybe even next lecture, that Allah mentions uh, that there's something called ghuraf in Jannah. Now, in our modern Arabic, ghuraf or ghurfa means an apartment or a room. Okay, this is in our modern Arabic. In classical Arabic, uh, ghurfa or ghuraf basically means, you know, a, a, a luxury, basically a, a accommodation. Okay, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term ghuraf to describe, we would say in our English, a VIP suite. Okay, we would say in English basically a five star, whatever it is, or even more than this, obviously. And uh, the Prophet said, the people of one level of Jannah will see the people of the ghuraf like you in this world, you look up and you see the northern stars, you see the southern, the stars in the sky, and they're flickering on and off, like that they will see them. So the Sahaba said, O Messenger of Allah, those people in the ghuraf, they must be uh, the prophets of Allah, right? No, nobody else is going to reach that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, I swear by Allah, those people are people who believed in Allah and who followed the messengers. They're not the prophets. The prophets are even higher than that. So a righteous person can be in those ghuraf. A righteous person can be all the way up there as well. And that's the, uh, the point of those uh, ghuraf. And we also mentioned in our last uh, two lectures ago, we mentioned uh, that the lowest person of Jannah, Adna Ahl al Jannah, the Prophet said the lowest person of Jannah will be given this world and 10 times like unto it. So again, we have low and we have high. In a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna uh, fil Jannati mi'atu daraja, that in Jannah there are 100 levels that Allah has prepared for those who strive in His way. And between every level to the next, it is like between the heavens and the earth. So the distance between us and the heavens, that's as far as we look up, that's between one to two. And then two to three is another, then three to four is another. So the Prophet is saying that in paradise, there are 100 levels dedicated to those who are striving for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, therefore, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then ask him for firdaus, because it is the best of Jannah. It is the middle of Jannah. It is the highest of Jannah. And above firdaus is the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from firdaus, all of the rivers sprout uh, forth. And in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that in Jannah there are 100 levels. If all of mankind were to be gathered in any one of them, it would be sufficient for all of them. So then what do you think of 100 levels, right? So this indicates that there are, again, each one of these levels, both of these narrations mention 100 levels of uh, Jannah. And in one hadith in Tirmidhi, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that uh, whoever prays these five prayers and fast the month of Ramadan, has a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he shall be forgiven, regardless of whether he migrates from his land or he lives in the land where he was born. 
And so, uh, and in one version he says, regardless of whether he went to strive or not, meaning if there's no need to strive for the way of Allah, you know, you're just living in the land you were born, then you are fine. So a man said, O Messenger of Allah, shouldn't we go and inform the people that, you know, there's so many places of Jannah? So uh, shouldn't we go and uh, inform the people? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, let the people do as they are doing, because in Jannah, there are 100 levels. Between every two levels is between the distance of the heavens and the earth. And the highest level of Jannah is Firdaus. And above that is the throne of Rahman. And it is the middle of Jannah. And from Firdaus, all of the gardens of Jannah, all of the sorry, rivers of Jannah uh, spring forth. Okay, now let's pause here before we move on. I just quoted you two or three hadith. They all say that Jannah has 100 ranks. Mi'atu daraja. Does this mean it has only 100 ranks? Or does it mean it has more than this? In fact, Jannah has much more than just 100. Because you see, this is a common misunderstanding that when a person reads these hadith, they think it is exclusivity. On the contrary, what our Prophet is saying is that out of the many, 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 many ranks of Jannah, there are 100 that are meant for those who strive in the way of Allah. That's what the first hadith says. In the other hadith, he is saying that uh, Jannah has so many levels, there are 100 amongst them, for example, that any one between the two of them is like the heavens to the earth. He never said there's only 100. He is simply saying there are 100 that have these characteristics. This is similar to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he describes the names of Allah and he says Allah has 99 names. And then he describes, you know, uh, some of them. So, or, or he says that whoever memorizes them shall enter Jannah. And many people misunderstand that Allah only has 99 names. And as I explained in my other lectures, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an infinite number of names. However, of them are 99 that are special. So, the same applies here. Jannah has more than 100 levels. How many? We actually do not know. And it is probably beyond what our minds can comprehend. And in fact, there are references to this as well. So, of those references is the famous hadith uh, in Sahih Bukhari and others that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the one who has memorized the Quran he, it will be said to him to enter Jannah and to read as he used to recite in this world and to rise up. And for every single verse that he rises, he shall rise up one level of Jannah, right? Now, there are over 6,000 verses in the Quran. So how is it possible? وَيَصْعُدُ بِكُلِّ آيَةٍ daraja. For every ayah, he will go up one level or one rank. And that is why it is narrated from some of the Sahaba Aisha and others. It is narrated from them that they said the levels of Jannah are the same as the number of verses in the Quran. It is narrated from them. The point being thousands and thousands of levels of uh, Jannah. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. It does appear that Jannah has way more than 100 levels, but there are definitely uh, you know, uh, levels of Jannah that you will see them like the stars. And that's between one to the other. What do you think of the ones beyond them? And so every group of people of Jannah, they will see those above them in the distance. They cannot even imagine way up there. And that keeps on going higher and higher until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And then you will get to Firdaus al-A'la. And that is the highest level of Jannah. And in fact, even within Firdaus, where we also get the indication that there are names given to the levels of Jannah. There are names given to the levels of Jannah. And it seems like perhaps even within a level, there are sub-levels because we can derive them from the level given to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that of course he is in Firdaus Al-A'la. Of course he is. But in fact, within Firdaus, there are levels as well. And there is an entire level dedicated to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is called al wasila It is a name. It is named. That level is named. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you hear the Mu'addin calling the Adhan, then repeat after him and then send your Salat upon me. Because whoever sends his Salat upon me, then Allah Azza wa Jal will send 10 blessings upon him. Then when you finish that, Ask Allah that He grants me al-wasila. 
Because Al Wasila is, listen to this now, Manziratun fil Jannati. It is a manzila in Jannah that is only given to one person. And I hope that I am that person. Now our Prophet ﷺ said, I hope I am that person. And we say, of course he is, because there is no one else that is worthy of it to the level that he is. And therefore it is called Al-Wasila. And Al-Wasila is that which brings us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is called Al-Wasila because it is the closest to Allah. It is right under the throne of Allah. It is the pinnacle of Jannah itself. And it is the height of Firdaus al-A'la. Therefore from this, we can sort of even get a hint that the levels of Jannah have names. And these names are known to the people of Jannah and the highest level within the highest level of Firdaus is called Al-Wasila. And that's why when we hear the Adhan, we say, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma wa salati al-qa'ima aati muhammadan al-wasilata wal-fadila. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give our Prophet Sassam Al-Wasila. And as for the Fadila, some say that the Fadila is uh, also the, the, the wasila. And some say the fadila here is the uh, knocking of the doors of Jannah and entering Jannah uh, the first. And some say the fadila is to hold the flag, you know, on the day of judgment. So multiple interpretations are given. Uh, what is the uh, fadila, the blessing that is mentioned here? But the wasila, our Prophet has explained what it is, and it is the highest level of Jannah. And with this, uh, we therefore conclude that Jannah has many, many, many levels. Of them are 100 that are definitely extra special, it looks like, but it does appear that Jannah has far more levels than this. And each person is going to get the level, depending on what we conclude with this verse. وَلِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا Everyone will get their darajah based upon what they did. And that's why our Prophet ﷺ said when he said that whoever prays the five prayers and fasts the month of Ramadan has a covenant with Allah that Allah will cause him to enter Jannah. So the man said, O Messenger of Allah, why don't we just go announce? What did he say? Leave. Don't make this that common knowledge. Don't make it something spreading. Let people strive more and more. Let not people be lazy. Why? Because in Jannah are 100 degrees. That if you look at any one of them, it is like you are between the heavens and the earth. Meaning, you don't want everybody to aim for the lowest. Let people strive. And when they strive harder and they pray more than the minimum and they give zakat more and they fast more and they are whatever good deeds they're able to do, they do. They will rise higher and higher and higher and they're going to be happy as they go higher up in Jannah. Therefore, dear Muslim, don't be mediocre. Don't aim merely to pass. Don't aim to be the last person to enter Jannah. Aim for the heights of Jannah. Aim for the very creme de la creme. Aim for Firdaus al-A'la and strive your best to do whatever you can because really that is the ultimate victory, the victory of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Firdaus al-A'la and may He grant us the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.